One of the beautiful things about technology is we've been able to hear so many more stories and it's not going through one filter anymore where there's three TV channels and one newspaper. There's a lot of ways to share information. And, and because of that, there are so many more stories to listen to. So if you are a parent, I also think it's your responsibility to think about all the different ways people can navigate in this world, all the different interests. And I'm not just talking about sexuality. They could be a TikTok star to an electrician to like all the ways you can grow and be in this world. There are many and, and being open to that, as long as it brings love and joy and no harm, why not? Hello everyone, welcome to Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. I'm Denise. And I'm Kirsten. And we hope you will join us as we explore the ins and outs of building healthy relationships with our adult children. Together, we'll speak with experts, share heartfelt stories, and get timely advice addressing topics that matter most to you. Get ready to dive deep and learn to build and nurture deep connections with our adult children. And of course, when to bite our tongues. So let's get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Bite Your Tongue, the podcast. I'm Denise, and sadly, I'm not here with my co-host, Kirsten. This was an episode she really wanted to do, but the timing just didn't work for her this time. I'm so sorry she's missing it. Anyway, as many of you know, June is Pride Month, and every June, we try to do an episode that addresses the LGBTQAI plus community. And we are so excited for today's episode because we're celebrating Pride by talking to the Emmy-nominated Matthew Rodriguez. He has hosted and produced the NBC Chicago's top-rated Chicago Today show since 2019. And I just learned he's in his second season for an amazing show. He's the executive producer and host of It's Okay to Ask Questions. The series showcases open and honest conversations with trailblazers in the LGBTQIA community, delivering candid dialogue with no topic off limits. And for all of us parents of adult children with the ever-changing queer community, it's great for us to know it's okay to ask questions. So welcome, Matt. I love, first of all, how you start your episodes, and I'd like to steal it and start our episode with this. So listeners, this episode is opening minds and hearts with thoughtful conversation. Welcome, Matt. Oh, I love that. Thank you for noticing our open. Well, you know, it's you, so beautiful. Yeah, you know, you record these things and you're in a, you're in a room and you, you record it and you write something and you, you see it a thousand times because you're editing with the producers and the editors. And you just forget what it all means, you know, and then you release it and people respond and it can be quite overwhelming that it's it's that original intention that you kind of forgot about because you've been so caught up in the technical part of it. I'm sure you can relate with the podcast. I can, but it's something. so beautiful. It's so beautiful. So I want to remind you when we get started that our audience is mostly parents of adult kids. So we're mm -hmm. talking 55, 65, even into the 70s. And I think in an interview you did with Chicago Magazine, you said that you have an imaginary viewer, Betty Sue. Yes. So today we're talking to all the Betty Sues and all the Bobs of the world struggling over understanding the changing face of LGBTQIA community. And we're really hesitant to ask questions. So that's why I love the title of your show. So tell us a bit about your show, why we should watch and how it will help us understand more about this community and how we should approach asking questions. Well, that's so funny. I love that you caught up on that. You know, my executive producer from the other show I host, Chicago Today, created this imaginary viewer. And, and I used that same scenario for this show because the Betty Sues and the Bobs of the world that live on Main Street, that's just a generic name we created for our viewer, they, they do care. And like we were talking about before we were recording here, they have that gay cousin or they have that gay nephew or they have that friend who is identifying as transgender now. And they can sometimes be a little overwhelmed and not know how to approach it. And I myself, as a gay man, part of the LGBTQIA community, had that same feeling. I had a lot of friends coming up to me and saying, can you explain what it is to be non-binary? Can you explain what it is uh, when someone realizes they are transgender and wants to make that transition? 
I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Just because I'm gay and we're kind of on the same side of the street didn't mean I knew everything there was to know. Just like they don't know everything about me. And with that, when we were trying to create this show, I was kind of expressing that in a meeting and I just blurted out, I wish it was okay to ask questions. And we said, that's the name of the title because that's the way so many people feel right now. So many we've people. We've created silos, whether we like it or not. Um, we've created boxes and walls and all that kind of stuff for many reasons, not just about this subject. And I think we're afraid to ask the questions. We're afraid we'll offend. We're afraid we will be misunderstood when we ask the question. So I think if you go with, go forth with intention and love in your heart and joy and listen to the response of the question, that's half of it. You know, the title is only half of it. It's okay to ask questions, but you got to listen to what they say. You got to digest it, ask some more questions, maybe step away, come back to it. That's really at the heart of it all. And, and we've done that through these wonderful interviews this season, we have Rosie O'Donnell, who I think a lot of your viewers, your listeners might might know and connect to. Um, we have Jojo Siwa, who's a much younger audience, but still still an important voice. We have a, a woman from uh, Los Angeles. She is a lesbian, Zoya Biglari, and, and she's from a Persian family. And in Iran, which is where her parents are from, if you come out, you could be killed. You, it, it is punishable by death. And for her family to come to Los Angeles and then their daughters say, I'm a lesbian, that would take them aback, right? And so it took some time for the family to um, move through this, this new revelation. So we have many stories like that. I, I've learned so much. I think the viewer can learn so much. I think we come at it with a very gentle, foundational approach and making, you know, we don't get too, too into the weeds. Some of the, some of the episodes we can get deeper into definitions and what this means and what that means. But I, I think it's something that most people can sit down with a, a loved one or your family and, and take away some really easy bites, if that makes sense. I agree. And I, I haven't watched every episode because I only found out about it when I saw you on the Today Show. And congrats on that anyway. Oh my gosh, um, thank you. And we will link how people can watch in our episode notes. But I did watch, there are a few episodes I want to talk about. The first one was season one, episode one with, and again, you're right. We don't know all these people. Shay Coulee, is that right? Coulee. Yeah, Shea who's Coulee. a very well-known drag queen. Okay. RuPaul's drag race and is in the drag scene, and which is a whole other world that can seem scary to people. And I'm going to ask you something about that. Yeah. But what I Go want to ask it. about this is, and she identifies as she. I can use the pronoun she, right? I noticed I was trying to make sure I got my pronouns right because I love this that. is hard for us too. She says, and I really found this, kids are not born in the closet. They go into the closet mm -hmm. because they've been told to be ashamed or they're ashamed. Expand a little bit on that because that was touching to me. She said she knew by the time she was four. Wow, I hadn't... Um... That makes me a little emotional because I hadn't, I haven't watched that episode. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I hadn't, you know, you record these and you, I, sometimes I forget even what was said and I, you, I can't remember everything. And that just hit me just now because it, it's, it's very true. I feel like I'm hearing it for the first time. You're just a kid. You're just acting and, and reacting to the way you see the world when you come out and slowly piece by piece. You see how someone reacts to, you see your family or your parents or a neighbor react to another, I'm going to use me as an example, another little boy acting a little effeminate and they get a little squeamish and they get a little weird and they're like, well, why, why are you doing that? You should be out there playing with trucks and none of that. And so that's one thing. And then that little boy grows up and, and they want to be, you know, they want to play piano or they want to dance. And why are you doing that? You should go to soccer or vice versa for a woman or, you know, there's so yeah, many yeah, scenarios. Yeah. And bit by bit by bit, you're putting a little piece of brick in front of them, brick by brick by brick by brick. And then all of a sudden that kid can't see anymore, right? That kid can't see out of all the things they've been told they shouldn't be. And, and why would we do that to someone? Why would we do that to anyone? Straight, to anyone gay, doesn't matter. Your race, your religion, like let us live organically and free. Shay is absolutely right. I think... And, and and can we fix that? I don't know. It's almost impossible to not put some of your thoughts 
and beliefs on your children, but make sure you listen to them because even if they're four to 85, like it, it doesn't matter. People have opinions and thoughts that are organic and, and come from it with inside from the day they're born. And, and if you don't believe that, I'm sorry. It, it's true. There are certain things that are just in our souls that we, we cannot ho- hold back. That's beautiful. You explained it well, because that really touched me, because I think we do that with lots of people, not just queer people. I hate to say this, but the way people look, the way, oh, God. The way whatever it is, if they're not your eyes athletic, a little like, off. Your, yeah. your nose, oh, that nose. Oh, yeah, that voice. nose. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Quiet down. Your voice is too pitchy. Your voice is too high. You know, mine like, is. Oh, oh no, oh. no. <laughs> I'm thinking my sound is bad. Okay. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if I stopped the interview and said your voice? Is too- well, I would have appreciated your telling me my sound wasn't good. Anyway, good. no, your sound. Okay. Is okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to mention two other shows, and then we're going to get to a few questions. I love the interview with ER Fightmaster. Again, there you go. I have seen them a hundred times, never knew their name. Yeah. And I've seen them on Grey's Anatomy. But anyway, I thought, who's ER Fightmaster? Mm-hmm. Anyway, they explained that they identify as non-binary and their pronouns were they and them. But you asked them how they felt about the new pronouns Zed and Zay. Is that right? Am I saying that right? My Zed and saying? Zay and there's Z and there's 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 many others. How are we expected to keep first tell us what they are and how are we expected to keep up with all this? Well, I mean, you know, if there's a new restaurant in town, you learn the name of that really quickly. No, no, you? we don't. At our age, we don't. We you say, don't? Okay. that place down there on the corner <laughs> that serves that. Thai food. <laughs> well, that's why. And, and so listen, so this is what I think. And I hope I don't, I hope I'm not speaking out of, out of line because I am not a expert on all of this. No, no, I understand I, that. Don't worry. But, we understand that. But from what I, what I took away there, is unless somebody tells you they are this specific pronoun, the Z or the Z, and, and there are, I've encountered not that many, and, and there okay. might be some, but for the most part, again, asterisks from what I understand, I have seen that most people just like they or them, and, and that's quite easy. So we have their he, him, she, her, and they, them. And I know a lot of people say, the grammar, but the grammar, it's plural. It's plural. We use they, and ER says this all the time. We use they, you know, you leave your glass. And I'm like, where, where's Denise? They left their glass here. You know, you would say they in, in passing. So I would just lean on the they. We've all gotten that and we're working yeah. on that. But then all of a sudden, all this new stuff comes in. But I think being respectful and if you're talking to someone is the best thing to do. And I think then people understand. That's it. I forget people's names Every day I will meet someone and two minutes later, I forget their name. So I think a lot of people just need to remember that part. If you just think about that alone, like I can't even remember someone's name. Right, right, right. Sometimes. So just go in with grace. Just say, remind me again how you like to be referred. That's it. Yeah, that's and, perfect. Because I never know whether to say, what are your pronouns or how you like to be referred? Sometimes I feel like I'm too mind. woke if I say, what are your pronouns? I don't think anyone's going to be offended by you saying, what are your pronouns? Unless it's someone who's anti any of this. And then well, then I like, don't really care. Right. Exactly. <laughs> but anyone, anyone who's identifying as non-binary is certainly not going to be offended if you ask what their pronouns are. Now, if they've told you their pronouns 50 times, right, right, they right. might eventually, like if I told my name to you 50 times, you'd get a little annoyed. And I, I don't get me wrong. I've met people where they like, we've met before. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm embarrassed. And I don't remember their name. But I think that's a way to think of it. I think that yeah. can help. That's yeah. helped me. All right. Now, though, this one, I hope I pronounce this name right because I literally made my husband watch this last night. Okay. Um, Pigeon Pagonis. Pigeon Pagonis. Yes. I want you to tell her story. I'm not going to tell it. Okay. Because. Yes. I didn't understand this at all. And the way I want to tell everyone to watch this episode, I think it's season one. Is it season one? It's all, these are all season one. Okay. These are all season one. Okay. I guess I haven't gotten to season two yet. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, I never understood this. So I'd love it explained to me. She was born intersex, but go ahead. Intersex. And then again, I am not a scientist or a doctor or anything, but with this is, this is what's different. Intersex is not something uh, pigeon chose. And and not that I think someone who's gay chooses this, but this is like 
this is when you are in a, intersex, this is like you were physically born this way. There's no debating. She was told that her ovaries were removed because she had cancer. Yes. Yeah, so let's back up. Right. Okay. So go ahead. You do it. Born, and uh, gosh, I don't want to mess up her story because. You know what? Um, they can all watch it. So you do the can, best you can but, and then but watch here's it. Here's the thing. I, I won't be specific because I can't remember everything about Pigeon because it was a year ago. And I, but right. what I will say is there are people that are born with uh, genitalia. And I'm just going to dumb this down body parts from the female side of the spectrum and the male side of the spectrum, right? I think in certain cases, someone might have actual testicles instead of ovaries, but they aren't descended. So that means they're still like up in the body and you might have a an enlarged clitoris. So, but with still an opening that can look like a vagina, but you don't actually have a full uterus with inside of that, if, if that makes sense. So it's kind of like, the body was processing in while in the in the mother's womb and it stopped cooking, right? Like the body stopped processing, it stopped growing, and it just reached a certain point. Again, I hope people don't backlash on me and I would love everyone. No, no, to look nobody up the word will. I... So your audience might remember the word hermaphrodite. Yes. We don't yes. use that word anymore. Um, some people do, but we don't use that word anymore. We use intersex. And Pigeon story was quite remarkable because. She was born and they thought, oh, you know, it look, she looks more like a girl. So we're going to lean in, like her body, her genitalia look more like a girl. So we're going to lean into the fact that she's a girl. And they performed certain surgeries on her to make her more of a girl without ever explaining it to Pigeon or giving her the choice until she was older. And she actually found out by putting the pieces together. So her family kind of knew, but the doctors knew, but they never told her that. They told her she had cancer. They told her that, that she had all these surgeries because they needed to prevent her from the cancer from spreading and all these type of things. She actually has a wonderful book explaining all of this. But what had happened was she found out all about this and figured it out later. And turns out with certain chromosomes and all of her DNA, and I know this is very confusing, she actually would have been better off leaning into being a boy with what she had. But at this point, when she was in college and, and realized who she was, it was too late. The, the surgeries had been performed. They had done a surgery to enlarge her vagina. Very, very graphic. And it might be too much for some people. No, no, it's very enlightening. It's very enlightening. And Pridgen is so honest and raw. And, and that conversation was wonderful. And, and it, it's something that people don't talk about. And almost 1% of the entire population is intersex. That's a lot of people. A lot That's of millions people. Millions and millions of people that we, you know, we might know people and you would never even know because they could they could present one way on you know on their face, but down below there's something else going on and they can be embarrassed and shamed and feel isolated. So when I say the alphabet, the queer alphabet is what we call it, LGBTQIA, the I is it's intersex. intersex. Yes. And there's the there's the struggle for transgender rights, right? We're we're trying to let children make a decision early on in their in their process. If it's supported by the family and supported by the doctors and the child, if they want to make a transition, they should be able to do what they'd like. Now, the opposite is true when we're talking about our intersex family, because if they don't have the right to make the decision and the doctors make it for them and it's forced upon them, that's a really horrible situation. So this struggle between intersex rights and trans rights can actually can pin the two against each other. So politicians can say, oh, well, in this case, you don't want the doctors to perform anything for these intersex kids, but for the trans kids, all of a sudden you do want them to do something. So it can get very complicated. There's a lot of shadows there. And a pigeon goes into that conversation as well. It's a wonderful it one. And you do a great job. The interview is so wonderful. So I really Thank encourage you. everyone to listen to that. You know, Katie Couric did a National Geographic show several years ago. I don't know if you've watched it called A Gender Revolution. And I remember she did that. Yeah. And it. I've always encouraged our listeners to watch that because there are several and I never knew it was intersex. And I'm not sure if it, I watched this so long ago, just like you, but a couple people that their sex, like they were born with both genitalia 
and the doctor decided who they were. And when they became adults, they realized they were not a boy. They mm -hmm. really were a girl and people were criticizing them. And I thought, how could, you know, this person was just, someone said, okay, we're going to choose this and cut everything else off. So that really opened my eyes, but I didn't understand the whole intersex thing until right now, or until I watched Pigeons. And, and I got to say, and it makes you think like, look, if mother nature created this, this child, right? And, and it, you can physically see that there's something different, right? Like it's it's not a full vagina, it's not a full penis, wh whatever they're, and it's all different. It's, I'm, I'm, these are just examples. It may not even right. present in that way. There's many ways to be intersex. There's lots of categories. But if Mother Major, Nature can do that, why couldn't it create other different types of people? Why, like, So why wouldn't we think that there are other ways that we align with our sexuality and with our gender? Like, why do we think it's one or the other when mother nature herself has created people that are all in between and in, 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 in different gray area? I mean, it's like a physical presentation right there. No, and you're, you're I, absolutely I right. And when you brought up transgender, I wasn't going to ask this question. In fact, I took it out of my questions. But, you know, last month, I think her name, Sarah Huckabee Saunders in Arkansas, mm -hmm. came out that said she her state was not going to comply with the federal laws for the treatment of trans stu trans students. That's right. In their schools. How do you feel when you hear these stories that we're trying to go forward and then we get 10 steps back? You are putting these kids lives at risk. You are yeah. telling a community that they don't matter. Their thoughts don't matter. Their beliefs don't matter. And you are putting them at risk of death. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Children who don't have the ability to transition are, and I, I don't have the exact statistic, but are much, much, much more likely to commit suicide. You're endangering them with themselves and the way they feel about how they exist in the world. And then you're endangering them by telling everyone in the community, it's okay to hate on these people. So I'm certainly not all right. Oh with gosh. You're giving them the okay to say, no, these people aren't like us. That's not right. We wouldn't do that to anyone. I don't want to do that to anyone. I don't to care anyone. what side of the political spectrum you're on. Everyone should have their right. But to say that these people can't be who they are without it harming or affecting you in any way, don't tell me it does because it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me it does. They, give me one example. Mm -hmm. It's very that good. Good job. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to ask a, a couple of little more questions about the show. And then I have some listener questions. Great. Uh, because it's okay to ask questions, right? It's okay to ask okay. questions. And you know what? I have to, if we're on YouTube here, I just want to admit my disgusting smoothie. It's just filled with vegetables and goodness as I'm saying. Okay, it. okay. It looks wonderful and it's why you look so good. <laughs> um, so as I was watching some of these, I thought to myself, you're interviewing so many celebrities. Have you ever thought of interviewing a regular Joe or Josie? Sometimes people watch and they say, well, you're a celebrity. It's easy for you to, you know, whatever. How does it feel for someone who's not a celebrity? Right. Well, I think, you know, I don't think everyone that we've interviewed is a household name. No, no. Um, half so, of them aren't household names, but they have right. a persona. Right. But right. they have a persona and, a, and a, a slight following in some cases. And I'd say in season two, we even found people with more of a quote unquote following. And when I say that, just maybe some of your viewers like, a large following on Instagram or TikTok. And that, and I've said this many times, it certainly doesn't mean that their story is any more important than right. someone next door where we don't necessarily know who they are. It doesn't. And in fact, that other person might have a more incredible story. The, the reason we have leaned into some of that. Now, this season, we have someone like Jojo Siwa, who is insanely popular with a younger audience. Rosie O'Donnell, really big really well known with an older audience. We chose to have some of those people because it makes people watch. And if I can put Rosie's story next to Cody Daigle Orians, who is an asexual advocate out of Cleveland, Ohio, who is not as well known, but it makes someone go and watch that episode, then certainly then I'm amplifying not only Rosie's story, which is valid and important, but also Cody's. And then Zoya from who I mentioned earlier, the woman from Los Angeles. I try to be very diverse when I'm booking the show, not only in the story being told, but who they might be connected with. Is it an older demographic? Is it younger? I like to represent age. If I if I had my way, I would do 15 episodes. We yeah. could do, you know, a, a range of race, and I, but I could only do six. 
And we had to pick and choose and it's who says yes and who says no and doing that whole thing. Yeah. Puzzle. Tell us about Rosie O'Donnell's story. She has a transgender daughter. A non-binary Non-binary. Child. non-binary. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Do you say non-binary daughter? Or how would I say? A non-binary child. A child. Non-binary. Okay, so non-binary child. Child is a neutral. There's no gender associated. I like Rosie's story. Rosie struggles with the pronouns. Rosie has a tattoo on her arm that says they, them. Like if Rosie, who is a lesbian, known around the world has trouble remembering that her own child viewer who is having trouble can relate to that. That's why I chose Rosie, not because she was the ultimate get because of that reason alone. And I think that's really important. All right. Okay. So you've said when you came out to your parents who are old school Catholic, your dad got upset and your mother fell to the floor crying. Yeah. Okay. So what advice do you have for our generation of parents when their adult child comes to them? What are some of the things they can say that will be, they don't want to fall to the floor crying. Let's put it that right. way. Yeah. They don't, you don't want to do that. And again, I love my parents. and I know you do. And you've said people. that. I don't want to. Yeah. And it's great yeah. that you've been honest though. Yeah. I'm going to be honest. And I, I've been writing a lot about it and I've been reflecting on that time. So who knows what more I'll talk about from that time. But look, I've realized as I've gotten older, I might not have realized it in the moment, but it took me a long time to realize I was gay, right? It it took years and years and years for me to put the pieces together and come to terms with that. And when I did, then I was like, oh, okay, I'm good. So then when I told my parents who had known me for 21 years in a certain way, and they had, regardless of the signs that were there that might've said I was gay, they didn't see those. And they just listened to what I said and I was straight or, you know, pretending to date someone or whatever, whatever I'd say to them. I didn't really talk about dating. They thought I was straight. So obviously it took them some time to wrap their heads around it and their minds around it. So I would say if you need to and you can't say anything in the moment, I would hug your child, kiss them, say I love you and say I just need a moment to process this. I just, because I don't want to say the wrong thing, I want to say the right things to you. Now that's like a last minute. If you can't get the words out, if you feel like you're going to blow up and you're going to explode and cry, that's what I would do. I think other people might have different suggestions, but I would just hold them, say, I love you. And I just need a moment and that's it because I want to say the right thing to you. So I need to, I need to collect my thoughts. And I, I think that would be understandable. Your child might not get it in the moment, but I think as time goes on, they, they might reflect and say, oh, I'm glad my parents did that as opposed to dropping to the floor crying, right, you know, right. like I it was a I- slow fall for my mom. She kind of like slid <laughs> off the couch. It was like a slide off the couch onto her knees and then she came kind of crawling. Well, you know, up. some of it is, and I think it's a two-sided kind of thing. The child who has also decided to come out needs to give their parents some time. The parent has to process, and I've talked to this about a lot to a lot of my friends who've, who've young adult kids or teenagers have come out. When you hold your baby in your arms when they're born, you already are walking them down the aisle. I know it sounds crazy because weddings aren't even like that anymore. But you have this vision of their life. And all of a sudden, it changes. It's not that you can't accept that new trajectory for them. But you have a son, you might have, instead of a daughter-in-law, you're going to have a son-in-law, possibly. The advancements of, I mean, they still might have grandchildren. You know, all of that. All of that. You need time to process that as a parent. And I hope that on both sides, the child who's coming out understands that the parents might need a little time to process it. I think some kids would. I think some kids wouldn't. It's going to be, it's just, it's to each each their own. I also think as a parent, and I'm not a parent, you have to make sure you're dreaming in all different ways for your kids, right? You have to reimagine that dream because there's- yeah. It's not just the Disney Snow White story anymore. And it never was, by the way. It never was. It's just what we were told. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beautiful things about technology is we've been able to hear so many more stories. And it's not going through one filter anymore where there's three TV channels and one newspaper. There's a lot of ways to share information. And, And because of that, there are so many more stories to listen to. So if you are a parent, I also think It's your responsibility to think about all the different ways people can navigate in this world, all the different interests. And I'm not just talking about sexuality. They could be a TikTok star to an electrician to like all the ways you can grow and be in this world. There are many and and being open to that 
as long as it brings love and joy and no harm, why not? You are so incredible. That was so wonderful. It's the first time I've heard that and it really opened my mind. You're right. We need to see a wider world. Yeah, that's it. You are 100% right. That was so good. Okay, so a listener wrote, her gay son thinks gays feel inherently flawed and have emotional baggage. This is not my opinion. And I think he's being too hard on himself and the gay community. How should I respond when he expresses that to me? I, that's a hard one. Because I know that kid. I know, like, I felt that way. You know, I Mm -hmm. I think when you first come out, there can be some self-hating that even if you've come out, you know, I'd come out and I had lived out of the closet for years. Oh my God, it was 10 years I had come out. And I joined the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus. It's an amazing organization. Oh, I, I know everything about that. Okay. Oh, you do? Okay. And well, we have a gay men's course in Denver too. Oh, there's many across yeah, the country. Okay. It's beautiful. But anyway, so I had joined this and I was surrounded by 300 men that, 300 gay men of all shapes and sizes and beliefs and diversity and, and some living very out and proud. And, and I was so uncomfortable. I wanted to quit. I wanted to, I wanted any excuse to get out of this chorus because it made me feel so uncomfortable. And, and I realized week by week that I was uncomfortable with how open and honest and, and true to themselves my fellow chorus mates were. And I, even though I was out in Los Angeles, I had lived in Los Angeles before moving to San Francisco. Even though I was out, I was still very much in a straight world. I was with my straight friends. I did straight things which I love. There's nothing wrong with that. But I hadn't hadn't been around as many gay people. I had kind of isolated myself. And I realized it was because I was kind of hating that side of me deep down subconsciously. And when I was with these, my my gay brothers of the, the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus, they were kind of like cracking me open to another side of me, like a more maybe a little bit more of a flamboyant side, maybe a little bit more a side that wanted to be a little bit more free about my sexuality that I always felt shame from, that I always felt like I needed to hide. I don't want to make people think like I, they were shoving this down my throats. It was just an honest, beautiful way of living where they were proud who they were. And, and so that took time. And I, and I don't know this, this gentleman or this person's story, but you know, maybe they need to experience more. Maybe they need to find their community so that they see that there are many, many, many queer people who don't feel any sense of pain or sadness. I think oftentimes the only stories we hear about the LGBT community are negative ones and my struggle coming out and my struggle finding out I was transgender and my but many times there's no problem at all. And they have a beautiful story and they live their life with joy and freedom and they're, they're okay. So I, I, I would try and help him find those stories mm-hmm. and, and that mm-hmm. might take a little work and, and find that community depending on where they live, may take a vacation, but that takes time. It mm-hmm. takes time. So you brought up this whole idea of flamboyant and someone did write, you know, I have no problem with the gay community. Why the flamboyance? What is important about the flamboyance to the gay community? It's certain, well, number one, it's not everybody. It's not. No, no, no. That's right. I don't think you're saying that. But I mean, it's look at your friends. Look at your straight group of friends. Yeah. Are they all different? Is one loud? Is one quiet? Is one yeah. more dramatic? That is who we are. And why would we be any different? Just because it's some rainbow fabric. <laughs> that's some, And that's not always what it is. It's just expression. And when you really, if you could just take a minute okay, to think about sometimes what flamboyant means, and it sometimes it means makeup and a dress on it. I'm referring to like a gay guy, yes. which is what I think you're- That's referring. what I'm referring to too. Yeah. A gay guy wearing makeup and, and a wig and stuff. It is just, it is a made up, makeup is not a real, it doesn't come from any place, but a human made it up and said, we're going to put it on the girl instead of the guy. These are all made up things that humans have created. And someone just said, no, that belongs on a girl and a guy. If you believe in God and you think God 
is taking the time to worry about who's wearing mascara and who isn't. I'm sorry. There are some well, bigger You just things. made that so clear. Right. That's, not that's my not, style. It's not your style and it's their style. That's right. it. It just happens to be something that was labeled as feminine. That's mm-hmm. all it is. And that's made up. And just like women, we're, you're told to shave your legs. Who, what, what is that? What, I mean, you know, do what you want, but like your whole life, you've had to shave your legs because some company came up with an idea to create razors and sell them to you. Mm-hmm. If you don't think it's because someone's making money off of telling you to shave your legs, and I'm not telling you not to, I'm just saying right. it's all about my, all of these products are made up. It's not real. We weren't born that way. You're right. They're all just things. I think if you're, you can think of it that way, right. you wouldn't care if a woman's in a tie and a man's wearing stilettos. No, it's you classic. see a woman in a tie, it doesn't bother. I wouldn't say bother you. You're not as shocked when you see right. someone that's, you know, whatever. But you would also be shocked if a woman, a regular straight woman walked into a room completely flamboyant. Color and life and love and living out loud. And I will say when I was in the course, I felt the same way. I was like, why are these guys so flamboyant? Why are they so out? And I just realized it was because it it made me uncomfortable with like the, the issues I had. It was bubbling right. up things in myself because I felt shame if I were to do that. Right, Maybe deep right. down inside, I was a little jealous that they were having that fun. And I don't wear wigs and mascara and makeup all the time. But if I want to try it, well, I should be able to. You should and be have. able to. And it's been fun, but I don't do it all the time. You're right. I I am so glad I've had this opportunity to talk to you. Okay, this is my last question, and then I'm going to go back to the show real quickly. But one parent said, what do you say to parents who are afraid for their children? I mean, we had the bombing in Colorado Springs. They're afraid of bullying. They're afraid possibly of being not getting the job they want because someone doesn't want a gay person working at their whatever, being hurt. How can we help parents feel, I guess, anytime your kid is in a marginalized community, you worry about that. Well, I know lots of parents that worry about it. It's share. And, and, and my parents were the same way. And that's yeah. where a lot of their concern came from was they were afraid that I was going to live this awful life. Now, slowly, as they became more educated and, and watched me navigate through the world, they're like, oh, well, in fact, he's living a beautiful, bright, out loud life. And uh, there's risks every day in our world, right? There's risks. There's a lot of gun violence and it's not just gay and straight. I would say what you can do to help them feel more safe and be more safe is be vocal. Stand up for, for your gay mm-hmm. son or your an ally. daughter. Be an ally because that is what opens minds and hearts. You having this podcast and bringing me to viewers that might not have ever heard my story or heard about my show, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is a step in the right direction. I got this beautiful email and it, and if you want to cut it out, but I just got this beautiful email this morning from a man in Kentucky. And he says, I, and, and if you want, I, I'll read it. And if you no, read, read it. it, please read it. He said, I'm a cisgender, which means just if for anyone who doesn't know, it just means they identify as a, a man. Like they, okay, straight. they were born male. They are male. They're straight, cisgender, straight, white male. I have every privilege that can be bestowed upon a child at birth in this country, except except the wealthy part, which I thought was funny. (laughs) After seeing you on the Kelly Clarkson show, I decided to binge It's Okay to Ask Questions. I've always considered myself an ally, but living in rural Kentucky, I don't have many queer friends to dive into discussion with. So your show was an eye-opener. Hearing Rosie O'Donnell mislabel her daughter let me know that it's okay for their parent to make a mistake. It's okay for me to do so as well, so long as we're genuine in trying to learn. After watching 11 episodes of your show, I decided to take action. Today, a small group of open-minded people, tough to find out in the country, met for the first time as a team to discuss bringing a pride festival to our small town (gasps) next June. I just want to thank you for your motivation, the education, and for giving queer educators a platform to teach. If that email doesn't sum up what we're trying to do with this show and what this oh. conversation is about. Did that bring you to tears? Yeah, it did. Rural and Kentucky, I, did you say? Rural Kentucky. And I don't know this man. And just, I found that he got my email some way and reached out. And if that is the one thing that comes out of this show, that is huge. 
I, I said to him, I want to come. Like, let me know when you do this pride, I'll show up. All right. Well, I was going to ask you the last question. What do you want people to get from your show? But I yeah, think yeah. that email wrapped it up. That's so it. that's a perfect way to end. And I just can't thank you enough for joining us. It was really great. Oh my gosh. Thank you. And, and just thank you for wanting to learn and be open to this conversation. That's all we can all do, right? That's it. Right. Just, exactly. Just thank you. Well, that's a wrap. I just love Matt Rodriguez. That's all I'm going to say. I hope that everyone listening will tune in to his show. It's okay to ask questions. It's on Peacock. I'll put a link in the episode notes on how to watch it. You can also watch all of season one on YouTube. At least I found it on there. Everything he said is not just about Pride Month or the gay and lesbian community, the queer community as they say now, but about all people. What a warm, wonderful personality and something we all can learn from. Tune in. It's okay to ask questions with Matt Rodriguez. Thank you to Connie Gorant Fisher, our audio engineer. Please send us your questions at biteyourtonguepodcast at gmail.com and log on to our website, biteyourtonguepodcast.com. Feel free to buy us a virtual cup of coffee. It's only $5. It helps us continue to do our work. Thanks, everyone. And remember, unless you're asking questions because it's okay to ask questions, remember, sometimes you have to bite your tongue.